Welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad that you've joined us. We're going to talk about all things plants and fall and whatever comes up. So we're glad that you're with us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the College of Aces on the Urbana campus in Crop Sciences Department. All right, let's find out who's here. There are three really knowledgeable people right next to me. Let's find out who they are and maybe answer some email questions as well. Let's start first with you, Mr. Chuck Voigt, Professor Chuck Voigt. <laughs> Good evening, Diane. Hi. I am Chuck Voigt. I'm in the Department of Crop Sciences like Diane is. Uh, I teach home horticulture. Uh, so that's pretty broad. My, my real specialties are vegetables and herbs. So those would be things that I could talk about All pretty day. knowledgeably. Yeah. Uh, I brought in something we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. I decided I needed to try colored cotton this year. Uh, so I started them in the greenhouse. Didn't get the degree days I would have liked, but we're finally starting to see some of them. I had three browns, two greens, and, and one that, that just conventional. Um, you can see how much longer the fibers are on the, on the conventional white fibers. And you can see a little bit of difference between the, the three browns. Um, <clears throat> just kind of, kind of interesting. I think if we'd had more degree days through the early part of the summer, uh, because you know I gained a, a month, which should get me pretty much mm -hmm. out of Southern Illinois into places where they actually grow cotton. Um, and the reason I, 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 I ever got interested in this was probably 15 years ago, I read an article about a woman somewhere in the Southwest, New Mexico or somewhere, who uh, was making a big push to, to make organic clothing out of colored cottons because then they didn't have to be, they weren't dyed. The natural colors actually darken with age instead of fade. And I swear she had a blue one, but I couldn't find a seed of a blue one, you know, so that you could have a blue cotton. You can kind of see some of the drawbacks because the longer fibers would spin more easily. And uh, I've also read since then that uh, the fibers on these, on the brown ones are probably not as strong as some of the others, but it was, it was great fun. Uh, and, you know, they're probably six feet tall, but really? the majority of the, of, the, of the bowls are probably gonna frost without ever Mm-hmm. Because you need a little more heat and day length. Yes, this was not an ideal summer. I have not seen the brown cottons. That's really interesting. And the green one just didn't make it enough. A couple of them were, were popping open, but I, they didn't really look green, so I didn't, I I didn't bring them in. You know, I love green and, and, mm -hmm. and, and would hope that, you know, maybe somewhere in a protected lower part of the plant, a couple of those will pop open and actually be green. but. It, it was fun, and, and, and if anybody can find a, a blue seeded, a, a blue fibered one, I would, I would try that next year. Okay, I was going to say, try it again and then report back. Very good. Thanks, Chuck. And now let's toss it over to you, Kelly Alsup. Uh, thank you very much, Diane. My name is Kelly Alsup. I'm a horticulture educator for Livingston, McLean, and Woodford County. So I work very closely with the master gardeners. Um, my specialty really is greenhouse indoor foliage. Um, I love talking about insects though, and today I'm gonna to talk about one particular insect called brown marmorated stink bug. This is a invasive insect. Uh, right now it's uh, in the Northeast and has uh, become a, really, a big problem for um, you know, vegetables and fruits and ornamentals and um, Another thing that it actually does is it kind of comes and invades the home the way your Asian lady beetles do. So uh, this could be the first sign. Uh, we're actually uh, looking for this insect. Uh, so if you were to find a brown marmorated stink bug, we would want you to perhaps bring it into the extension office so we can identify your county because we want to know what the distribution is. Well, there's some uh, particular identification characteristics that you can see. It has these white bands on the antenna, really uh, smooth shoulders. You won't see bumps on the shoulders and um, just black and white where the wings meet on the abdomen. Um, and definitely something that University of Illinois is very interested in knowing about the distribution of this 
potentially invasive insect. Hmm. Very good. I did not realize that. Okay, thank you, Kelly. And now, Mike Brunk, let's go to you. Okay, I'm Mike Brunk. I'm the Urbana City Arborist, uh, the community's tree consultant, if you will. I'm uh, <coughs> involved a little bit in the landscape beautification in the community and the Landscape Recycling Center as well. So my expertise can vary, uh, but mostly in trees, if you have tree questions. And uh, I have a, a, a letter uh, from a, uh, a viewer that um, has a question about his dying apple trees. And he states he has three apple trees of different types that he's never seen this problem before. All three of them have had many of the ends of the limbs die back on them several inches. And if there are any apples on that section of the limb, they just shrivel up um, as the limbs die back. I've had these trees for several years and have never seen uh, anything like this before. And he's wanting to know if it's a virus or high temperatures or moisture conditions. He sprayed the trees uh, three times this year with an approved spray. Uh, and it doesn't seem uh, severe enough to threaten the life of the trees. The problem doesn't. Uh, I was wondering if uh, we know what the problem is. So um, this is what I would suggest uh, that, first of all, it sounds like it might be fire blight. Um, if it's something like that, it's very important to prune out the infected branches. But before you do that, you really need to find out exactly what the problem is. So I would call the University of Illinois Plant Clinic at 333-0519 and they can give you guidance on what kind of uh, what uh, type of sample and what size sample to bring in. Usually it shows some of the infection but they want some live tissue as well and they can ID that problem and then you can uh, accurately know what you have and know what and how to treat it. Okay, very good advice. <laughs> They're always ready. I don't know when they close but do they stay open? They're open to all year now. All yep, year. All oh, year. that's wonderful. Since they moved into Turner Hall, they're there the whole Excellent. time. Excellent. Thank you for asking, answering my question. They're right down the hall for me. So okay. <laughs> Very well done. Well, next, we want to go to a Did You Know segment. To make one pound of honey, bees must tap two million flowers. And we thought we were busy. <laughs> that is busy. Well, we want to find out what you have for questions for us today. So let's go to Don's question on line three, and he's got a plant question for us. Hi, Don. Hi. Uh, listen, we've been uh, wondering a few experts out there can help us with the names of uh, some grasses out south of uh, Curtis Road, and it's west of Philo Road. Okay, I think I've yeah. got people whispering to me, so all of you can ask answer the question. Well, it's it's probably in in the area of the energy farm yes. where they've grown a lot of, of of grasses for biofuels. The the biggest r rankest looking one is is <laughs> is giant miscanthus. They also have considerable switchgrass there, which is a, which is which is a native uh, prairie grass. And then smaller plots of a whole lot of other things, as well as some woody plant material. That was the there. giant miscanthus the one our colleague collected um, and went overseas to collect? Was that the but largest probably one? Probably when when biofuels were hot before gas prices went down, um, they they were. I think that was the one collected in Korea. Right. Yeah, I was one of our colleagues. Did right, because it's it's a it's a sterile hybrid, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and they were trying to get some breeding material on both sides so that they could make. <clears throat> right. Some new crosses and see if, you know, what what they could, you know, <laughs> horticulturists like to tinker. So. Yes, we do. Well, that was a good question, and and all three of the panelists knew, and and I, I just drove by them today. Oh, you did. Okay, yeah. <laughs> great. Well, if you see really really tall grasses, that's probably the giant miscanthus. Well, thank you, Don, for your question. Let's go to Barb's question. She's on line four, and it's about hardy mums. Hi there, Barb. Hi there. I I watch your program all the time. Thank you. But. My, my question is, uh, I've planted hardy mum <clears throat> on the east side of my house, and uh, I've been told that they, they won't come up next year because they, uh, uh, I, I live in the country, and they're te uh, my friends are telling me that uh, they need a lot of sun, but when I read my uh, little 
uh, tag that came with the mums, it said it needed some sun, not not all day sun. My question is, will they come back next year? And so, Barb, you already have them planted right now? Yes, I do. I think for hardy mums, and Kelly's going to jump in too, because I can tell, <laughs> but for hardy mums, the main thing is planting them early, mm -hmm. giving them enough sun, and it doesn't have to be a full day, but a lot of people plant them in the middle of November, right before Thanksgiving, and they don't get root development. So planting them early is probably on your side for them coming back. Now, Kelly, take it away. Add your two. I concur with you. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, when we, when we have the mums available, it's the inappropriate time to plant them because there's not enough time for them to make it through the winter. And if, if, if people actually get them through the winter here in Illinois, it, it was a mild winter or they put them in a protected location. So, you know, if it's right up against your house, it might, it might make it through the winter. But yeah, I agree that, you know, full sun is better. You'll get a leggier plant with less sun but uh, it'll still flower and you're, yeah, you have a chance of it coming back, but maybe it won't. So May and June, is that the early time to plant? If yeah, you can get to find them? The season is the ideal time. Yes, mm -hmm. <coughs> but if I see them in September and I get them planted, I'm going for it. But I did go as late as October, 1st of October, and, it, and I mulched them heavily. But if you leave them on the porch until after Thanksgiving, oh, you're kind of up the creek. You might as well they, just they're, they're drop them in the freezer. They're basically <laughs> potted cut flowers at that point. Uh-huh, that's right. I <coughs> think, yeah, the mulch was a really good um, uh, comment. To, if you mulch them, that will make them a little bit more cold hardy. And the taller they are, if you trim back, you know, once they're past their prime, just trim back half on them. Several people have trimmed them all the way down, but if you trim them back half, we find that leaves collect in there and it actually helps mulch them some more. And I like to put bulbs in and around because mums are beautiful to interplant with bulbs behind them. And I don't know if that helps them, but it sure looks good. And I think if you do plant them early, would you uh, deadhead them? Or, or I'm sorry, cut the buds off so they flower later well, in the depends. year? Good question. A, a lot of the, the, the newer varieties have kind of been selected so that they're almost self-pinching so mm -hmm. you get a, a globe shape just naturally. If you get some that, that aren't like that, then the recommendation usually is, is to keep pinching out the tips until a, around the 1st or the 4th of July right. and then let them go because if, if you pinch them much be beyond that, then, then the flower buds may not set up in time to, to, to mature. Okay. So all of these, it's a mum <clears throat> dissertation because <laughs> we really like having the mums and, and there are ways to keep them. But Some of us grew up next to a, a mum breeder here. <laughs> well, you know, you just, uh, you learn. And I, I took so many mum cuttings when I was in college. Yes, it was exciting. So mum's a word. Ma oh, <laughs> someone had to do it. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, Phil wasn't here, so Mike had yeah, to do my, it. Yeah, Mike might as well have someone. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you for that question, Barb. Let's go on to <clears throat> Donna's question. She's on line five, and it's about clematis, or is it clematis? It's clematis for me. Donna, hi. Are you there, Donna? Line Actually, five. Actually, I think that it's Kathy. Oh, and it's a question it's... about um, spider plants that have been out all summertime and bringing okay. them in and not bringing in spiders. Oh, okay. So br I can tell this is a Kelly question, possibly. Bringing your plants in and not bringing in critters, is that... The first thing is, is what's wrong with spiders? <laughs> I knew she might say I, that. I actually like spiders. Um, you know, spiders are great for getting rid of some of the insects, but you know, when I bring my plants in, I do check them for insects. If I do have an insect issue, I might do an insecticidal soap before I bring them in, or I might just spray them with a hard water spray just to rinse them off. And that would definitely get the spiders out of your plants. Mm -hmm. But just because they're called spider plants doesn't mean they're prone to having <laughs> spiders all over them. No, no, no. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they bring in their house plants in the fall is they try to pot them up. 
So don't, we wait till the spring to pot them up mm -hmm. because they're, they're not going to be actively growing. They're just going to be sitting around a little bit and try to put them in the sunniest spot you can find. I've actually already brought in my house plants because mm -hmm. I didn't want them to uh, get the freeze. Right. Yeah. yeah that, that's a mistake people make with some things is they leave them out too long and, and they're already damaged by the chilling. So mm -hmm. when you bring them in, mm -hmm. uh, they're already two steps on the road to the compost heap. Okay. <coughs> so there's some ideas for you. But Kelly had to say, what's wrong with spiders? All right. <laughs> okay, let's go to Clay's question on line six, and it's about a ginkgo, I do believe. Hi there, Clay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Yeah, this question is, I think, for Mike, an arborist question. Um, you bet. We've got a, 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 a very large, mature <clears throat> ginkgo, female ginkgo, that has uh, a lot, especially this summer, a lot of very unpleasant smelling fruit. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about Spraying or injections or something to, to kind of mitigate that reduced amount of fruit. Okay. Uh, there is a product called, I think it's called Florel. You can Google it. I think it's F L O R E L. I think that's what it's called. And it mm -hmm. uh, will knock the fruit off of uh, the flowers off of ginkgos if it's timed almost exactly right. So we've tried this uh, several times in the city where we've had trees surprise us and they weren't the males that we thought we purchased and they were females and we've had about 50-50 luck. So the timing is uh, key uh, and it's when the flowers are first starting to emerge and I think there's like a three-day window and so you really have to keep a tight eye on that and you have to time it correctly to, to knock that off and then you uh, will not have fruit that year. But you have to spray it every year. It's doable. Okay, so if hopefully the tree flowers all at the same time now, if too. It's a, if it's a large ginkgo tree, you're, you're almost going to need a professional tree sprayer to get right. the, the uh, pressure uh, uh, to cover the entire tree with a spray. Okay, so Claire, there's there's hope for you. I remember parking my bike and not realizing I had run over them, and then having to step in them. Yeah, it's there's exciting. A, a female in a bicycle parking lot east of Davenport Hall here on campus, mm -hmm. where they just get squished and oh, yeah. get that. It's a memorable <coughs> experience. You know, if you can, it, it may, well, this is more creative, but if you can <laughs> imagine that the smell's not so bad, maybe you can train the senses <laughs> to oh, okay. not being so. It's, uh, an, it's an important Asian medicinal herb. Mm -hmm. so. so there you go. All right, well. <laughs> it's a toughie. That's, that's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. And let's go to Ann's question on line three. And it's about uh, peonies, I believe. Hi, Ann. Yes. Uh, What's your question? I cut my, my tree peonies down like I do my other ones. Oh. They have beautiful flowers. That would be a giant no. Okay, I was looking at Chuck. <coughs> that's, uh, so no, do not They're cut They're called back. tree peonies because they have that woody stem that they need to keep and also uh, next year's buds are kind of involved in all of this. The only thing you ever want to cut off of those is anything that dies and last year's flowers so that they don't they don't try to make seeds or whatever but the tree peony basically needs to stay there. If it starts to get so huge that you can't stand it then kind of immediately after flowering you could <clears throat> probably take it back a little bit but basically that the woody stems on a tree peony need to stay there. Okay, so that was a giant no. Okay, let's go to our panelists and we're going to do another round of emails. Chuck. Okay, I've got a, a couple of <clears throat> caterpillar questions here. Uh, the first one is, I saw this caterpillar on my parsley and what kind is it? And that's a fairly easy one. It's that, that, that black and yellow wonder that, that, that gets on all the plants in that family. It is the, the larva of a black swallowtail. And <clears throat> if you have enough parsley or whatever that you can stand to lose some of the foliage, it, it's a great way to get some butterflies moving around in the garden. Uh, the other caterpillar question that I had, uh, this, uh, she thinks it's a silk caterpillar. It's about four, four and a half inches long. There are white things on it and it's on a tomato plant. Well, what that is, is a tobacco hornworm 
that's been parasitized by a wasp. Mm -hmm. And this it's a really interesting little wasp because it lays one egg and that leg egg within within the body of, of the caterpillar divides multiple times so that you can get 32 or even 64 from the one single egg that's laid and they kind of eat their way around inside the caterpillar and and kill it off and then when they get ready to pupate they all bore their way out out through the caterpillar's skin and 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 do that to it so if you have those on on your tomato plants and and don't want uh tobacco or, or tomato hornworms uh, on them, uh, leave that there, and then the next generation of, of those wasps will come out of those cocoons and can help help you uh, with control on that. The other thing is tobacco hornworm is much more common than tomato hornworm, so most people, what we see and call tomato hornworm because we see it on a tomato is really tobacco it is hornworm, tobacco. Okay. and that's that's a Phil, Phil Nixonism that I'm passing along. Very interesting. <clears throat> I'm sure that is true because it looks exactly like what we see. Okay, thank you, Chuck. And now Kelly. Okay, I have a question from Maxine from Chatham, Illinois. And she asked a question about um, oriental lilies. Um, she bought some that were white with red, light pink, deep rose. Um, they were beautiful, but um, a year later, they, she comes back, they bloom bright yellow. And so uh, one of the things that I do think is going on here is those are reverting back to their old genetics. They're not, the genetics of those are not stable enough yet. And we see that a lot with, let's say, um, like a coneflower where you get all these new, really pretty kinds, orange, and all of a sudden, we have, uh, you know, a year later, they've turned back to the traditional pink. So I think that that is what's going on is they are reverting back to their original genetics. And sometimes that happens in the industry. And that's a shame for what the colors you actually wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kelly, thank you. And now Mike. Okay, I have a pear tree question. And it is. Um, this um, person has a semi-dwarf Bartlett pear. <clears throat> it's uh, my second summer with it, and I haven't had a single bud. So uh, he's asking, or she, uh, do I need another pear? Um, I was under the impression that I didn't need this, uh, I didn't with this variety. Um, if not, do I have any ideas um, about the tree? So uh, Bartlett is purported to be a self-fruitful variety, uh, but there's some question there to whether it really is or not. Um, but first of all, I think your tree's only two years old. So I think it's very young, so don't expect it to flower or have fruit at this age. Wait a couple, maybe even three more years. Um, is the tree in sun? So you'll need full sun for a tree to fruit. Um, and uh, if you're uh, fertilizing any around the tree or if you're fertilizing the tree, don't fertilize the tree uh, or around the tree with uh, nitrogen fertilizer that can uh, produce more growth and less flowers. Uh, let's see. So um, the other thing you can do is self-pollinate the tree. So you may need to cross-pollinate and it's not going to, it's going to help uh, the tree uh, set a heavier crop of fruit, so it won't hurt it. Uh, so in order to do that with a semi-dwarf variety, you would want to find another European pear that you could put within 20, 25 feet. And uh, if you didn't have bees, if that was the problem, you could uh, manually pollinate it with a little paintbrush from one tree to the other. But I would first wait for a few years and just have some patience and see if the tree will fruit its on its own because it's supposed to be self-fruitful is what they call it mm -hmm. and uh, it may just be a little young so and, and it definitely won't set fruit if it doesn't have flowers right yeah right so that's the bartlett <clears throat> tree and what's the old-fashioned one Chuck? kiefer k-i-e-f-f-e-r okay and that's the old farmstead pear definitely self-fruitful uh, has some some Asian pear in its lineage, so it, it resists fire blight better than a lot of other European pears. It just 
sometimes needs to be ripened. <laughs> yes, it needs to be ripened off the tree or you get a lot of stone cells that can kind of gritty when you try to chew it up. But the flavor on a kefir is, is probably four times as, as intense as, as the flavor in a yeah, Bartlett. There you go. So it's a better better choice if you're going to try a new tree. My, my so when you get to kefirs. pears given to you for gifts, you put them in a brown paper bag, let the ethylene or anything that you want to ripen, let the ethylene work its thing. And, oh, yeah, if they Pears soften so off the great. tree, they're, they're, it's hard to beat them. Oh, it is really worth it. So the viewer has us wanting to get pear trees now that we've <laughs> talked about them. <laughs> and, and there's lots of varieties. So she was asking good questions. Well, that was great. Thank you to all of our viewers. You ask us really good questions, whether we get them emails or however, we ask you to keep it up. Well, we want to thank you for watching, and we hope that you continue to have a great week gardening, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.